when, when I get to that? Exactly. Yeah, okay, good. Good, okay. So I'll have him do that one. All right, ready? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have, have uh, a limited amount of time today, so I'd like to just go ahead and, and move into this. We're going to have a hard stop at 10, and I want to provide as much time as we can for some of the Q&A for you to be able to answer, ask, and, and uh, get answers to your questions from us. Um, what I'd like to, to do in terms of kind of the overview is, is to answer a number of questions that are probably in people's minds. Um, what do we know now since I've last addressed you? It seems like it was just yesterday, um, but it was uh, about two weeks ago, not quite. And um, at that time I talked about we would have this first open meeting and have more discussion about what we know. I also want to be able to tell you what we have done and what we will continue to do and also how you can help. And many of you have offered to help, and it's so much appreciated. Your concerns, your, your anxieties, the questions that are out there, I feel them, I hear them, I have them, and um, so I want to uh, uh, make sure we're all working together and channel our energies and focus on the things that are so important to us all. So we'll talk about those in a number of different uh, ways today. I'd like to also start out by thanking you for the uh, concerns that you've expressed, the support, and your questions and offers to help and the things that many of you have already undertaken as we proceed. So the format and what we'll do uh, today is I'll provide some updates fairly briefly. We will have uh, some comments that I'll also describe about the budget communication, the, the budget communication task force, um, which will be shared by Provost Britz and Vice Chancellor Lujak, and we'll uh, talk about some of the elements around governance group involvement, what has been going on and what will continue to occur, and then provide time for the uh, Q&A. In terms of updates, there's a few, a few uh, uh, elements that I'd, I'd like to cover. So I'll talk about, just as a preview, our commitment to the Wisconsin idea. I'll talk about what we know and don't know yet about the proposed budget possible impact, our cost containment measures that we have underway, what we have done in response and will be doing, and, and further, further information uh, for going forward. You're all familiar with the Wisconsin idea and some of the elements in the news surrounding that. As you also know, the Wisconsin idea has guided this, this great UW system for more than a century um, to, to really look at something that originally Charles Van Heist, the UW system president in 1904, said that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. This is a critically important idea, and it goes deeper when you look at the text where it talks about the basic principle is that the university should improve people's lives beyond the classroom. It spans our teaching, research, engagement, and service. And these are critically important words, and we're so pleased that the, any efforts to dismantle the Wisconsin idea have come to a close. We will always champion the Wisconsin idea at UW-Milwaukee. Specifically, what we do and what we have done uniquely within the UW system is provide five core elements, and those are in front of you on, the, on this sheet here today. We are accessible, we are urban, we are public engaged in a research university. Those five core elements cannot be found anywhere else in the state. And they're critically important. They're critically important for the things that we do that nobody else has done or can do. Where would you go if you wanted to find the largest supply of nurses, of engineers, of teachers, of arts, of humanities, of people who enrich society, people who contribute in a meaningful way in an accessible, engaged manner from a research perspective. We're deeply engaged in the community, as you know, through our arts, through our work in public health, in social welfare, in business, just to name a few of the areas in which we're tremendously engaged. What we know is that there is a proposed $300 million budget cut to the UW system, $150 million per year over the next two years of the biennial budget. That would translate into roughly $40 million or $20 million uh, per year for us. So there's been no change since I shared that information. And I think that um, what could be uh, helpful for you to know is that this is what has been proposed in terms of if the historic pro rata formula were used. 
there's some discussion about that may not be the formula going forward. We don't know, there's been no discussion about what would be used, but there's some possibility that there's, there's a, a different formula that may be used. This budget cut would be effective July 1st, 2015. The second part of this, the restructuring UW system as a public authority, that would not take place until July 1st, 2016. So the important point there is that the cuts are immediate, or relatively immediate, less than five months from now, and the proposed public authority would be something that happens later. Part of the logic behind that is that it would take a while for the language, take a while for the, for the structure to be designed and built, even though I believe that they would draw from the UW uh, hospital and, and clinic public authority model that, that um, has already been established. So, so it would take uh, some time to, to uh, put that in place. So as far as some of the measures that have occurred, in late January, President, UW System President Ray Cross sent a memo. He had issued a memo internally first to the UW System Administration. And he sent it on to the chancellors in late January and he said, this is something that we're doing at System. Immediately a question arose, is this supposed to be something that we're supposed to do throughout the system? He said, no, this does not apply. But then within a day he said, I would encourage you strongly to take such measures at your, each of your campuses. <laughs> um, so what our provost did at that point is, is he had been discussing with the deans this um, uh, measure and, and, and some of this, these discussions and he um, put in place some cost containment measures with the schools and colleges. And what I'm going to do later today is issue a memo that would make sure that we're all aligned, that we're all doing the same thing so that, that all the units, all our campuses operate in the same way as the schools and colleges. And let me talk a little bit about um, some of those, those uh, elements. And the memo will have more detail and explain this in a little more, more uh, uh, specificity. What our initial strategy will be, and, and just let me back up for a moment, the thinking behind that, this is that anything that we can do now to, to put a hold on some of the commitments going forward around non-essential types of things will help us weather a $20 million cut rather than waiting and, and us looking back in five months and saying we could have slowed down or we could have, we could have made some different decisions. So this is gonna ask us through this process to really look carefully. It is not a freeze. It is a hold on a number of things, three different categories. So let me just briefly walk through these. And this isn't all the detail, the memo will have a little bit more. But the first is to put a hold on all non-essential positions. So those, um, the exceptions, the clear exceptions would be those are extramurally funded through grants or contracts. The second piece of this is to put a hold on all non-essential out-of-state travel. And so that would be, when we say exceptions, out-of-state travel funded by gift or grant funds and not including out-of-state travel directly related to research or academic activities. And let me stress that again. This is quite a bit different than the moratorium, that's the word that was used um, from Ray Cross for system staff. This is different. We're a research university and we have to continue to support our research and travel that is booked, travel that is underway, that's completely fine. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, this is for us uh, non-essential out-of-state travel. So some of us in administration have looked at our travel and have already made cuts and said we're not going to go on those trips. It's just, it's something that we do not have to spend resources on. So we're looking across areas that we can to save that money. A third example, or a third, third area, is to put a hold on non-essential and discretionary salary adjustments. So this is where vice chancellors can consider some circumstances uh, to be essential. So the task force that I'll talk about next, the budget task force, is going to review these measures, see how much is saved over the next several months, and look at these and other types of, of considerations as we uh, look forward. So again, that memo will go out later today, but I wanted to explain it and share that and provide an opportunity for Q&A. So some of the other actions underway, and this is at the high level, and we have, um, just in terms of the composition so that you know going forward, our provost is a co-chair on both the budget task force as well as the communication task force. And that's going to provide consistency across both of those, structure, coordination, and, 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 and 
uh, assurance of, of moving those, those things forward. Robin Van Harpen, our Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administrative Affairs, she'll be the co-chair for the Budget Task Force, and Vice Chancellor Tom Lujak will be the co-chair for the Communication Task Force. Tom and Johanna shortly will talk more about the Communication Task Force. I'm going to cover some of the high-level issues around the Budget Task Force, and then Robin, during the questions and answers, can provide more detail if, if you have any further questions about that. We've identified the core members. We will have the first meeting of the Budget Task Force next week. The group is intentionally small. As you know, we've had some experience with this in the past, so we're going to use a similar model, but it'll be expanded to make sure we include the governance groups. We have um, some of the campus uh, leadership and finance folks that, that have worked on past uh, budget task forces, so, so that's the general starting point. It will expand and it will include more later on, but for the first pass, it needs to be small and nimble. The charge of the task force is to research different options, look at the impact of them, and recommend strategies for the short term, medium, and long term. Their role is to make recommendations to me. And so that's the, the charge and the, and the core work that the group will be undertaking. In terms of the background, in terms of some additional information that we know, given that we just had the Board of Regents meeting last week, there's some key takeaways, if you will, and I'm trying to summarize a day and a half of meetings into a few key elements that, that occurred during the course of the discussions. There um, is support from the discussion for a UW system public authority. That model does seem to have across the discussion some, some level of support. Seems to be some momentum behind that. Um, there was a lot of discussions that were fairly uniform about the budget cuts being a very serious and critical challenge. There's a lot of unknowns with regard to these changes, and, and there's critical analysis that's needed. You have seen in the public, in, in terms of, uh, from both sides of the aisle, in the public uh, discussion, lots of questions arising about, you know, the, the, the particulars on this. In the next Board of Regents meeting, all the campuses are being asked to provide information about the impact of the cuts. And by the way, we have been providing information as, during the fall, and frankly, even in the summer, as we were building a completely different type of budget request. And you might recall that era. <laughs> it, seems, it seems like it was um, just yesterday, but we had actually been pursuing a $95 million request from the state for the UW system, and the regents had approved that as recently as August. We had been asked and we had been providing on a regular basis through our finance and administrative affairs and asking the different schools and colleges to talk about what the, what the pain points have been, what has been the, the, the consequence of the different cuts that we've had. So we have that document and we can basically say, here's the effect of past cuts, here's the current cuts, given that we're still dealing with a cut from last year, and going forward, here's what we would anticipate any further cuts would be to try to stem uh, this from occurring. But given all of that, we have a, a ready case to be able to talk about this, this piece for the March Board of Regent meeting, what has been the impact of the, of the cuts that, that uh, we anticipate. One other update or type of update from the Regents meeting, um, one of the, the Regents who was there really eloquently spoke to dispel some misconceptions. He talked specifically about how we are efficient, and he really gave, gave a, a compelling case talking about some of the data that exists. He also pointed out that research is not an extra and linked that back to the Wisconsin idea, and I will link it forward to UW-Milwaukee, that this is a critically important value-added contribution and necessity for the types of things that we do. It's why we are distinct and, and so important in this region. A chancellor, Rebecca Blank from Madison, talked about it was, it was her annual address, just like um, I have an annual address later with the regents, where she talked about, we cannot absorb the cuts. Many of her comments dealt specifically with UW-Madison, but you can see in much of her writing and her work, just like me, we're talking about UW system and we're really trying to advocate for ourselves together. The cuts are too large for the universities, for the system and for Wisconsin. And I thought she was particularly compelling. So what have we done? Some of you see some of this, but very few of you see all the different things. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that in the last two weeks, we have done a tremendous amount of work. 
there's a number of groups that really should deserve, and I'll acknowledge them, <coughs> excuse me, later and, and give credit to those. But let me first talk about the media. In the print media and television media, I've been in no fewer than six different television appearances or media interviews. I will have tomorrow an interview with the Journal Sentinel editorial board. Later this week, I will be with the editorial board of the Milwaukee Business Journal. I was with WISN television yesterday. Professor Mark Schwartz and I will be featured in that tomorrow night. I'm sorry, Thursday night for probably an extended uh, interview, an extended program, four to five minutes on WISN TV. You can see some of the headlines here. You can see the advocacy. And many of these feature myself or um, some of you who have been out there. And there's daily between probably 20 and 30 different articles <clears throat> that are appearing that are focusing on this issue. There's been tremendous media. In fact, there's articles that are about the media attention that's focused on this. And I can't say that it's unlike anything else recently, but that seems to be the impression uh, that's out there. There's just tremendous focus. People really care. Um, and, and just to be fully disclosing, not everybody cares in the same way. And not everybody cares about the same thing. And that's perhaps why there's so much interest in this. But it is intense. There's no question about it. When you have a story that comes up, many of these articles, there are between 1,000 and 1,100 um, follow-up online commentaries within 24 hours. The media folks have told me that's really exceptional. You, you rarely see that. So this is something that's, that's getting intense scrutiny. And I can also tell you that some of you, um, you know, this is for me a situation that I have to find a, the right balance. If I'm too strident and out there too, too far, I may lose credibility. And it will be very difficult for me to have some of the conversations that I need to have with the folks that I'm engaging with. If, on the other hand, I don't stand up for what I really believe and what you all care about and what we do, then I've not done my job. And I told you in my plenary how I will continue to fiercely advocate for UWM and really more broadly UW system. It's so critical to all of our future. So I want to share with you just some of the snapshots and encourage you to continue to, to read, engage, and, and, and share these, these stories. In terms of additional advocacy, we have spent and sent more than 52,000 messages out starting over the weekend. So we've included to our faculty and staff 6,500. Those went out Sunday. 28,800 to our students also on Sunday, and then to our Panther families, over 6,000 went out yesterday. We sent 11,000 to our alumni messages yesterday. We have today going out to our donors and friends a similar message in terms of the advocacy. So, so far, again, over 52,000 different messages that are out. And this is something that we will continue to, to um, provide updates on. We have, uh, last week, Tom Lujak and I were in Madison, and we met with six different legislative leaders. And these were not just any legislators. These are some of the key individuals on joint finance. These are individuals on the key college and university education committees, the leaders of these groups. We had telephone conferences when one of our joint finance members wasn't able to make it. She thought it was so important to talk to us. And we have been making the case, much like it's easy to, to tell, about the important things that we do and the contributions that we have made and why the need for support is so great for them to really reconsider and look at, look at um, if, if, if not no cut, you know, certainly a much smaller number, and also to have them understand the impact of the timing on this. So there's a number of additional points. But this is the same type of case when I've been in Washington, D.C., talking to the Wisconsin delegation, making the same case. But now it's in a very different context. And that context, of course, is one of strident advocacy directly with the legislature. So that was last week. This Wednesday, we'll be meeting with another group. And the following week, we'll be meeting with another group, direct meetings with the legislators, and so it's Tom Lujak and myself with the legislators, either one-on-one -on -one or with their key aides. And they're very helpful, and the discussion has been, I think, very productive and very informative for them to really understand, because a majority of legislators of the 130 are outside of the southeastern Wisconsin area. They represent every area of the state. So we can also point out 
how every UW system institution usually is a key piece of the local economy and why that's so, so critically important. So those are the legislative meetings and those will continue throughout the next several months. We also find how helpful it is for them to visit us on, on uh, campus. So at this point, what I'll do is ask um, both Johannes and Tom to talk about the Budget Communication Task Force. I'll come back and talk a little bit about governance group involvement and then we'll uh, open it up for Q&A. <clears throat> Thank you, Chancellor Mooney. I will just give a brief update on the uh, Budget Communication Task Force and then I will ask Tom to, to elaborate a little bit on it. We co-chair it, as Chancellor Mooney alluded to, and then the other co-chairs are, uh, are Pat Borger, representing the Alumni Association, uh, Michael Liberty for the students, as well as Joan Prince for the community. We met yesterday for about an hour, hour and a half meeting, where we discussed who we would like to co-opt on the, this uh, task force. It will include faculty. We looked at faculty that we think will do a very good job to advocate on our behalf, also student staff members, as well as I want one or two deans also on, on this committee. And as you could hear what, what uh, Mark alluded to, the Chancellor, was there's a lot of stuff already going on in terms of communication, but we need to continue that to be proactive, to be progressive, and actually I wanted to say aggressive in our message, uh, to shape the public opinion <clears throat> so that people can understand better the impact that it will have not just on our university but also in this region and to the lives of the people. And we also have to influence the legislative process as it's going on. We shouldn't just say we accept this cut and we plan according to as if it is going to be a 300 million cut. There's a lot of advocacy that needs to take place and that will be part of the task of this task force is really to ensure that we have a coherent strategy in the way we move forward to ensure that we bring across our message effectively also to shape public opinion on the value of what we believe in, that's public higher education. And we will also use this committee to effectively communicate with campus, and that's why I am on the both committees, the budget committee and the communication committee, so that we effectively can communicate the budget discussions that we will have on campus with our campus. Tom, and with these few words, I'm going to give it over to you. Great. Thank you, Johannes. The go-to place for information on the budget uh, is found right off of our home page. Uh, we highlighted here on a, on a screen capture of, of the home page the state budget information section, which is right in the lower portion, right below the marquee section of the, uh, uh, of the daily messaging that we send to campus. Uh, this is a place <clears throat> that we, our university relations team, has uh, built out over the last several days uh, that we hope will be uh, as timely and as, um, as complete as possible in terms of providing you with a snapshot of both what the public is saying in those news stories that Mark talked about, and very, very importantly, what the administration is doing in terms of our positioning, uh, the, the story that we are taking to the legislature, to the media, and to the general public. You'll find on this page uh, up at the uh, top bar, at the, the menu bar, um, links off to uh, the Chancellor's messaging, so if you ever need to go back and reference what he has said, it is there. UW System is uh, linked in there. There are frequent updates from system and we want to make sure that everybody here on our campus can access that data as quickly as possible. And then of course the daily news summary, the, the way that we keep our pulse, or, or, or rather our finger on the pulse, of uh, what the people in Wisconsin are saying about, uh, about this issue. Uh, again, these are updated and on the right hand side you see latest updates. There, that's an RSS feed so that in the course of a day, we expect that that uh, messaging will change. And you, you can actually set up to get an RSS feed so that you're instantly notified when there are changes. <clears throat> Very importantly, we've added an FAQ section that will allow you to uh, be able to answer questions, both for your own personal benefit, but also so that when others your friends, your neighbors, family ask you a question, you can go to this and quickly get the data that will allow you to be um, informed. And under resources, we also have now put up uh, talking points and facts about the university, and that's another section that will continue to grow. Uh, we'll actually have a PDF formatted <clears throat> presentation up either later today or tomorrow that you can download and print and 
hand to a person uh, who may have questions about what we're doing. Uh, and finally, the Panther Advocate section <clears throat> up on the top bar is critical because that's a way in which all of us can be involved. Uh, and the encouragement that we shared with everyone who received the emails from the Chancellor uh, over the last few days and continu continuing this week is that you can actually join us uh, in our effort to communicate the value that UWM brings to both the community and to the state. Um, as you'll scroll down the page, you'll find important links to the University Relations Committee uh, site. They have an excellent um, summary each day of actions that uh, either they are involved in or information that is coming their way. And then links uh, to the other legislative offices. Johannes talked about the goals of, uh, of our uh, strategic communication plan, and so I won't spend more time on that. In terms of our advocates, who are we trying to connect with this? Well, first of all, we want to inform the people um, who can best tell our story. Certainly that's you, uh, the faculty and staff, the people who are, who are the heart and, and the soul of the university can speak better than anybody else about the difference that we make. But we're also looking to our students to help advance our story. Our most active uh, 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 members of the community, both here on campus and uh, throughout Milwaukee, we call them our, our proud Panthers, and you probably see them here on campus at events uh, or down at the um, uh, uh, arena for our games. These are people who are hardcore Panther advocates, and we need to connect with them. And then, of course, alumni, parents and family, and regional business leaders are also advocates. Who are we going after? Who are we trying to target this message to? Well, obviously, the people who ultimately will make the decision on what happens with the budget are the state legislators. Those are the people that Mark and I have been meeting with and will continue to meet with uh, over coming months. But we're also directing our messaging to the media because of the enormous influence that they have in conveying the story of UWM and what a research university does uh, for this region. <clears throat> We're talking to business and community leaders because of the influence that they can have uh, on people who will be making the decision somewhere down the road in April or May, uh, and ultimately all of the stakeholders. Everybody in this room uh, is uh, a target because we need to make sure that you and everybody here is informed on what we're doing. In terms of that toolkit, we actually have developed a, a long list of different uh, methods that we will be employing to communicating our story. We have talking points uh, that are up on the web, as I mentioned, the FAQs, fact sheets, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, tools or, or channels that will be available. And these will be developed uh, even further as we work with the uh, task force that Johannes and I and uh, our fellow co-chairs or our fellow <clears throat> vice chancellors, excuse, excuse me, are co-chairing. Uh, the channels, as we mentioned before, are going to be wide-reaching, including those media visits, talking to legislature, legislators, communicating over the next several months uh, to the people that we already started a conversation with, with Mark's message uh, uh, this week. And then, of course, social media, which is uh, an absolutely critical tool for us to use in this day and age. And that leads me to uh, an update on the uh, uh, new e-newsletter that is going to be beginning this week. Uh, it is a terrific way for us to go ahead and on a weekly basis <clears throat> advance to everybody a collection of stories about what we do here how we make a difference. And so our university relations team has put together, and you'll see it roll out for the first time tomorrow, we'll be emailing it to everybody here on campus, uh, a collection of stories that you can then advance to your network. Uh, we're all true believers. Everybody here understands the value of UWM, but we know outside these walls, sometimes there's a fuzz fuzziness. People don't necessarily appreciate uh, the depth to which we touch the lives of people in, in Wisconsin. And so the development of this e-newsletter, we think, is a critical tool for you to use uh, to go ahead and promote the work that we do at the institution uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you uh, will see tomorrow that there, uh, it, it's incredibly easy. There will be a link for Facebook users or uh, Twitter users to go ahead and at the touch of a button advance 
any one of these stories that is especially important or relevant or meaningful to you, uh, or a story that you think can make a difference in terms of helping people understand what we do and why we do it. So look for that beginning tomorrow. And again, we welcome all of your input at the very, very front page of the uh, budget information section on our website. We actually have uh, a box that allows you to tell your story to us. And that will be another tool for us to use in our messaging to all of these different um, targeted groups uh, as we try to make sure that everybody understands the absolute value and impact that we have and why these budget cuts will be so damaging. Thank you, Tom. At this point, I'd ask Professor Mark Schwartz to join to give a brief uh, comment on what's been happening with the university committee. Uh, just very briefly, thank you, Chancellor. I just want to, uh, uh, as you know, the university committee has been trying its best to follow this situation and provide information. Our ucnews.uwm.edu webpage um, has proved a very valuable resource and uh, I want to personally thank my colleague, Lane Hall. It's through his tireless efforts that, uh, and with his vast staff, which is nobody, um, that he's been able to uh, do this. So uh, we're, we all owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Um, we're working. We have a uh, slide deck that we've tried to uh, summarize. Uh, we were able to adapt one that the TAA uh, group uh, that, uh, in Madison produced, uh, and we've adapted it um, and added to it. And uh, there is a draft up on the, the page now, and we'll be finalizing that and publicizing that uh, probably later today or at, uh, the, uh, at tomorrow. So um, we'll continue to do what we can to help in the effort. Thanks. Well, and I'd like to uh, thank Mark also for the um, heroic efforts that he's been putting in, the hours and the amount of time and, and uh, engagement on so many different fronts. Um, it's, it's critically important. I'll talk more in my closing comment about the role of shared governance and, and Chapter 36 issues. I'd also acknowledge that um, Sarah Morgan has been leading the Academic Staff Committee. And um, Sarah, if you can stand and, and just we know who you are, that's great. Okay, perfect. And then... Um, <clears throat> I know Sarah has been keeping academic staff up to date, and there's a website here uh, listed for that. <clears throat> Similarly, Stan. Um, Stan is here. Stan, if you can join and be recognized. So thanks for your leadership. <clears throat> and our student association is led by Ryan Sorensen. Ryan um, is in class, as it turns out, right now. Um, so, so. <clears throat> yes, and, and Lane Hall is teaching, I just learned. So, so um, take note. Um, but I did address the Student Senate on uh, Sunday night and had a good engagement with them, and, and I think it was very, very helpful, and I'm happy to go to any of our governance groups and spend as much time and, and, and share information and have dialogue about where we are and, and seek the input and, and, and counsel of all of you, all of you as we, we go forward. So let me uh, wrap up briefly. Um, what we know, again, coming back to the Wisconsin idea, and later, I don't know if it'll be out this week, I'm working on a, a statement a chancellor's statement, and, and I really do build around this, this concept, it's so important to all of us. Um, the reason I wouldn't have a, an address in an op-ed is because I'm going to be with two major editorial boards this week, so the likelihood of getting that published in addition to the stories that will come out is seen as not probably likely. So I'll have a chancellor's statement. And then I'm also working on a statement for all of the chancellors, and I've talked to half of them, for us all to be engaged in this, speaking with the same voice about the concerns that we, we have and, and our own advocacy uh, together. But the point of this is, again, we don't want to lose sight when we think about the Wisconsin idea of why we're here, the teaching, the research, the service, those activities that are so critical. We also need to continue to express an important rallying message, and that is without appropriate support for UWM and the system, the Wisconsin idea could become just words. It needs to be supported. It deserves that. We cannot and will not let that happen at UW-Milwaukee. How you can help, just if you haven't sensed this, to be as clear as possible. 
We need your stories. We need you to uh, see where we have right on the budget webpage that, that uh, Tom Lujak pointed out. Right, right on that particular website, we've got a place for you to share those. And what we'll be doing is turning those in to important documents that you can then share in a compilation. Continue to be advocates for UWM, for ourselves. Participate in these meetings and other informational sessions and, and give us your ideas. There will be future campus budget meetings. We'll have updates once a week for 60 minutes. And we'll do this for the next month and see, um, we'll use attendance as our indicator of what interest there is. I recognize that some of you are attending this today via live streaming. Um, so, so we'll try to get a, a sense of how much time we need, how valuable it will be. But I want to make sure that we have updates that are out. As an example, over the last two weeks, a lot of things have happened and have been developed, but people wouldn't know about those absent a forum like this for us to really be able to, to have this. Um, we'll also uh, reassess this uh, down the road a little bit. A few other thoughts, um, and, and um, before we turn it over to questions and answers, we acknowledge that there have been proposed budget cuts, but we are not accepting those as if those are in place today. It's too important for us to continue to advocate and for us to continue to do the types of things that I've described and that we all have today. We also need to stress the continued support for Chapter 36. Chapter 36 is core part of our DNA. When we talk about shared governance, we talk about tenure and indefinite status, those are things that have been critically important that have enabled us at UWM to operate in a manner that ensures buy-in, that ensures collective agreement, and it's the best way for us to operate. So that's my commitment, and I have continued to maintain that in all of my discussions. Some legislators have asked me specifically about the potential for restrictions with that, and I completely refute that. I believe and have believed. Thank you. I believe and have operated over 26 years at UWM as not only an advocate for, but a participant in shared governance. Why would we want to do anything different? Why would we want to, to change that? I simply don't see the logic for that. And people listen when they're asking, and I've had regents ask me about this, as well as legislators, and they're asking that of chancellors, and I stand strongly in my affirmation of that. So I wanted you to know that. I also would ask you that as, as much as I continue to thank you and we need your input, it's so critical that we work together, that we are joined together. The challenges that we face are not internal. The challenges that we face are ones that are coming from outside. And that's what we need to focus our efforts on in terms of our rallying cry and the support. So let's keep that forward-looking uh, perspective. I want to thank our staff. I can't tell you over the last several weeks, in addition to the work that our governance groups have put in, the tireless efforts, but as I think about the university relations staff, as an example, through this weekend, how many meetings, how many emails, how many, how many hours everybody worked in so many different areas, finance and administration, finance and, 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 and uh, administrative affairs, the staff there, again, to be able to provide the background, the documents, the materials that we're providing for the press <clears throat> and helping prep for a lot of these interviews, <clears throat> it's above and beyond. And then finally, in our um, alumni and in our development offices, development and alumni relations is on the front line. And I would say reach out to your donor professionals in your schools, Thank them in advance. They're going to be even more important going forward. And this is a critical role that they're playing on the front line every day, continuing to tell the stories, talk about how great we are. So I want to acknowledge those, those groups. And again, thank you for your undying efforts, things that you're doing every day to continue to make UWM great on the research, service, and, and teaching areas um, that, that we do all of the time. So with that said, um, let's open it up for a Q&A. We've got a microphone, and I'd ask you to come to the microphone. What we're also going to ask is that if you can limit your questions and comments to about a minute, that will be helpful, and then we can have a lot of individuals participate in this. Okay? <clears throat> If you can, yes, and what we're going to ask you is if you can identify um, who you are and, and what department you're in, that will be very helpful. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Fleischer from Linguistics. Um, I, um, well, first of all, I was, I was very heartened and appreciated. Okay, yeah, I'll pull it up. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, 
I was very encouraged to hear you at the end of your remarks uh, connect the funding issue back to the Wisconsin idea. Um, I think it seems like the the attack on the Wisconsin idea last week and its quick, you know, withdrawal. Um, I, I think it's clear that that idea offended people to a degree that uh, the governor had not anticipated, and I think it provides a very useful hook for talking about the funding issue. Right? Without appropriate funding, the Wisconsin idea is essentially moot, um, and so I think that that issue can be pressed. I, I just want to make two more quick points about the funding. Um, you mentioned um, at the outset that there's going to be a one-year gap between the start of the cut and the start of the public authority. Um, and the public authority is being held out as a justification for the cuts, right? We can, we can absorb these cuts because there's going to be this restructuring. Um, these are the tools that we're getting, right? But the tools are on back order for a year. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, so I, yeah. I, think, I think that's um, something that could be uh, more forcefully put out and, and made clear to everyone. And finally, um, on the amount of the cuts, um, the governor in his press release last week said that he wants to limit the scope of the debate to um, how much money can be saved through the restructuring. And he says, we believe it's worth $150 million a year. And um, it, I wonder where that number comes from. I think everyone should be asking, what's the basis for that number? Is there some report or analysis that establishes that? Or has it simply been plucked from thin air uh, because it's you know, very shockingly large? Yeah, excellent points. I, I agree. Thank you very much. Well done. Yeah. Hi, Chancellor Money. I'm Jasmine Allender. I'm a faculty member and on the Faculty Senate. And I have got questions about the restructuring and the public authority as well. From what I understand, um, public authorities, especially one that would be um, created to support an entire system, take a lot of time to plan. So I feel like the legislature has put the cart before the horse here. Um, I would like to know who's working on drafting the plan for this public authority what role campus is playing, if any, when we get to see a draft of the public authority, and why we would ever agree to let go of Chapter 36 before we have any guarantees of what this public authority would look like. I could provide some answers, but maybe more succinctly and more accurately, I'd ask Robin if you can address, and then Jolie Erden, if Jolie's here, she might be able, Jolie might be able also, because I think you've both been more closely involved. Robin, who would be best able to answer that? I can start. Okay. Is this on? Why don't you come yes. Up? Yep. Okay. Well, we do have at this point um, the legislative drafters have released a copy of the proposed new statutes, and essentially the outline of the public authority is found in those statutes. And there's a lot of unanswered questions in how the uh, public authority actually will operate under its own policies and procedures, but we we do have the loose outlines, and I could cover some of that if you'd actually. Like me to do that at this point? Would that or? be of interest to a larger group? Okay. okay. Yes, please. Okay, these are highlights, and then if I don't answer some questions, feel free to ask a follow up question. Um, but we know that the public authority would be created beginning July 1st, 2016. Um, most of the statutory language that currently pertains to UW system found in Chapter 36 and sprinkled throughout the rest of the statutes would be repealed under the current proposal. And the intent is that most of those provisions would then be moved to board policy. There isn't anything in the current statute that requires those repealed provisions to move over, but that is what we understand the intent would be. Uh, the current Board of Regents would become the board for the new authority. It would continue to be an 18-member board, 14 members appointed by the gov governor, two student members, um, and two members that would be, come from the Department of Public Instruction and one representing vocational schools. Uh, in terms of the budget, uh, beginning in 2016, GPR funding would come from the state sales tax. Eventually, starting in FY18-19, there would be a CPI escalator that would take effect. That would be something that would be really nice and something we've never had, which is an automatic increase that's tied to um, the CPI. Tuition would continue to be subject to the Board of Regents Authority. There's no change here. It has been subject to the Board of Regents Authority, um, but the legislature has uh, intervened there and has frozen tuition, as you well know, this biennium and for next biennium. Um, the authority would still be subject to emergency budget reductions. Some of the other areas where we would see flexibility is in terms of capital and facilities. Um, Non-GPR projects, that is projects that would be funded by program revenue or gifts and grants, would be exempt from the enumeration process that's currently in place. That's every two years, the Board of Regents submits its proposed capital budget 
through to the legislature and it ultimately is passed for non-GPR, non-state funded projects, they would no longer be subject to the enumeration process. There would be some more authority to design and manage construction projects that are not GPR funded projects. There are still some limitations there as well. The state would own all of Board of Re Regents property that is currently Board of Regents property, would lease it to the authority under a 75 year lease. The authority would be responsible for procurement, risk management, printing, and fleet. If you've ever experienced frustration over a purchasing issue, this would be potentially a positive change. We would have the opportunity to develop our own procurement systems. That would take time to develop. There would have to be some system to replace the current regulations that are very um, extensive that we operate under um, currently with the state. Human resources. Um, as proposed, the board would have full pay plan authority, would not no longer be subject to OSER and JOKER approval for pay plans. Of course, pay, the board and the UW system would also be responsible for entirely funding pay plans going forward. Um, the board would be responsible for its personal structure and employment policies. Employees would become authority, no longer state employees, but public or authority employees. Uh, Repe repealed personnel-related regulations would become a matter of authority policy, and employees would continue to participate in retirement and health insurance programs. These are the loose outlines, but there is a lot yet that would be developed under the policies of the new authority. Just a quick follow-up. Is there another state uh, whose entire system has gone to a public authority? So what's the model that we're looking at? And the second question is, um, other than massive tuition increases after the two-year freeze, where are the savings coming in, in any kind of significant way? Just, if I could interject just briefly, a lot of the things Robin covered is on our slide deck, so uh, they're going to have more of this from the campus, but uh, what we have up there now summarizes a lot of the things that she's covered, so you can take a look at that immediately. There are other states that have gone to a public authority system, but it really is, everyone is very different from the next. Um, I think ours was loosely modeled over the UW Hospitals and Clinics Authority, but it, it is very much a creation of the legislature in the statutes at this point. So Jolie may also be able to address, Jolie is our senior legal counsel, Jolie Erden, please. Um, just on the question of uh, the drafting and the timing, um, those are unknowns right now. Um, I would expect um, system will take the lead because those would be eventually board policy. So in conjunction with the board system administration staff uh, would work uh, if in fact chapter 36 is going to be repealed in the fashion that's been proposed. Uh, that system would work with the board uh, to determine which provis provisions would move to board policy. We don't know the timing on that right now. I think like all of us, they've been spending the last uh, several weeks just trying to absorb all of this information, work through what the changes are going to mean. Um, but as we know those developments um, and as we can share the timeline, uh, we certainly would do that um, as soon as we know what those are. And uh, in the past, um, if there are board policies going to be issued or board guidance, um, they do ask for consultation with, with the campuses. So we would expect that we would uh, be involved and have some opportunity for input and comment. And I Jasmine, your other question, which is important, which is quantifying the potential savings. I have not seen anything yet that has attempted to do that. I think the thinking is yes, th these flexibilities would be very helpful, but the savings are very long term as well. It will take a lot of development of the policies and systems in order to realize those savings. Long term, probably not anywhere near what the effect of this cut as proposed would be at this point. Thank you, Professor Allender. Uh, Thomas Malaby from Anthropology. So if over the last number of years uh, with this governing party in place, there has been a pattern of behavior where they send a message, engage in conversations uh, along one presumably reasonable moderate path, such as with the $95, $95 million increase that was uh, planned, and then suddenly uh, unveiled something long planned but not brought up in the course of those conversations, uh, we, we hear about this kind of cut or, or in the past other similar events. Uh, and that's on the part of legislators of the governing party, the governor's own staff. Why would we have any grounds, or I would be very curious to hear what grounds you may feel you have as chancellor and the other chancellors and other administrators and provosts to trust the regents in this whole endeavor. 
if they are primarily appointed by the governor whose people act that way. So the process is um, where the Board of Regents has been um, pursuing working with system administration and all of us to develop the uh, biennial budget request. Um, the the um, core of the question, uh, without going through the history in terms of how the governor's proposal um, was directly contradictory to what the regents had supported, so I think that's an important point. The regents had endorsed the $95 million request. The governor proposed the cut, and that's something that, that um, I believe that our regents and system administration have been um, negotiating in the best faith that they, that they can, um, given, given um, the, the nature of the discussions that, that uh, have been taking place. I have been involved in, in their public meetings in terms of hearing the updates from the Board of Regents meetings over the last several months, and know that was the path we were all going down um, in discussions with President Cross. He, UW System President Cross, he um, was probably more surprised than anybody, um, having talked to him last week. He simply did not see this coming. It was something where you have different, you have different um, uh, perspectives on this, where you have, have um, uh, the governor who has proposed one thing that's in contradiction to what we had been uh, asking for. As far as reasons that I would have for trust in terms of my own personal opinion, um, what I've seen is that the regents are operating in a, in a way that is as supportive and, and as strong as they feel that they can. Um, would we like to see um, uh, strident advocacy across the board from all of them um, that would, would really combat this as, as, as strongly and, and, and urgently as we all would? Um, that would be wonderful, but I think, I think it's um, something that, that many people are, are operating in different ways, some publicly and some behind the scenes to try to, to continue to build the case. But um, I think your question makes a point. I'll say that. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hi, Erica Sander. I'm here, uh, Professor Emerita. I'm here actually representing the UWM Retirees Association. And Tom, you know, we are working with you as well, so I hope you add us to your list. I know you're thinking of us kindly. Uh, I took the time to, and I've been active in governance throughout my career, for those of you that don't know me. Um, one, Mark, very quickly, give me a sense what you heard when you said there's some sentiment for the public authority. This is your reflection on the mood of the regions. Quickly. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that um, there is the belief um, from folks on, on the board that there would be value in the public authority. And I don't think anybody is saying that it would be quick, but, but they do sense. And, and, and where that comes from is that there are other states and other models that have gone down that path. So that's, that's why there seems to be the momentum behind that. Michigan, for example, has their universities in a public authority. I don't know offhand the others, but there are other models that are out there. Okay. That said, um, I have a grave concern about uh, the dismantling of 36. I took the time to read all of those strikeouts. Uh, boring, very boring, but when you're retired you have time, and especially, <laughs> especially when the temperatures are in the 20s and the dog wants to go for I a walk. I hope you had a good beverage in hand while doing this. Oh yeah, 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 it's a barley popper tent. Yes. Anyway, the concern we have as retirees is nowhere in the current governor's language anyway that has been proposed. Is there mention of us remaining as state employees? I was um, faculty repping in Madison at the time the hospital's um, authority was promulgated. It took two years. There were um, all kinds of people directly involved, med school faculty, uh, administrators from Madison, hospital people, clinic people, Board of Regents. Uh, I'm sure there were some state people also. Um, from Department of Administration, wherever. Point is, what I'm hearing here is what Governor Walker, I think, wants. And that is simply to control. One, two, to dismantle the Wisconsin retirement system. This time around, he's tinkered with not mentioning us as state employees in his proposal, and two, sick leave. Okay? 
these are very concerning to us, and so I think it's fair to say, whatever we can do to keep intact 36, either under an authority or not, we need shared governance, Wisconsin idea. And that's all we have to say, and I thank you for the time. I'm over a minute. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> If I can just clarify one thing, and I'll ask Robin and Jolie, um, who are closer to the, to the language and, and um, the, the, the intent. Um, employees that are currently, we are our state employees, and as a public authority would become public employees, but would still be covered by Wisconsin Retirement System and the health provisions, the health insurance provisions. So there's been no language that would change that as much as it would be something that would be carried into the public authority. And for back, is that accurate, Robin and, and Jolie? Yes. Yeah. And I, the only thing I'd add is that we're, we're looking at that as well. We're, we're very much paying attention to the impact of any changes in 36. The one provision that we know uh, that could um, that is slated to be repealed is the um, accumulation of sick leave prospectively. That's another one of those provisions that as of right now, I'm hearing nothing to the contrary. We would expect that that would carry over into board policy. Um, and we will, we will watch that. We are watching that. We're asking the same questions. Council are talking about any of any impacts that would change our status as employees apart from what we're called um, in terms of actual benefits. We, we are watching that very closely and asking all the same questions. Thanks. We have time for one, maybe two more questions. I've got a media interview scheduled for 10 o'clock. So um, we will have another session like this, but much less content, much more Q&A um, every week. So, so we'll just provide brief updates. Professor McClellan. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm Sandra McClellan. I'm at the School of Freshwater Sciences. I'm also an alumni of UWM, but I'm a parent of a first grader. And this is what I'm most worried about. This, um, and, it's, and I think Erica read my mind about the question you know, being, is it a done deal that we are going to become a public authority? Because this is what's probably more troubling to me long term. In case any of you haven't heard, there is a student debt crisis out there. I paid off my student debts, which were pretty light, 10 years into working at UWM. The, the debt that we are layering on our students is getting heavier and heavier, but more concerning, it's going to put college out of reach for for some students. So how are we going to assure that this just isn't a vehicle of shifting the cost of the college education to our students? Yeah, yeah you're, you're raising an, an important point. You're raising, you're raising uh, you know, one of the concerns that we are uh, raising. And this is why I think it's so important for us to advocate, for us to tell what we see as the consequences. And much of the arguments that I'm making is I'll usually start out talking about the impact, the lives that we've changed in Wisconsin and beyond. And then I talk about how we are already under-resourced. And I talk specifically about within our schools and colleges what we have realized over the last 15 years of cuts. And how when you look at this in total, we have had about $32 million in cuts over the last 15 years. The cuts that are proposed are by far larger, if you think about 40 million, $8 million larger, but if you think about it another way, the last cut that we had was our largest cut of $8 million. And that's the cut that's proposed right now is two and a half times larger than, than that. So the point that I try to make continually is how can we continue to have the accessible, affordable public higher education in southeastern Wisconsin? Where would you get that? For the future generations, for current generations, for parents, for families, for every organization that we impact in so many different ways, as well as larger society. So that's, your, your question is absolutely right. Now, a public authority, um, again, you have to look at you know, some of the thinking behind that, as I understand it, is well, other states have done that, and it provides a way for state government not to have as much support of that as it, as it has historically. I think that's the driver before, behind that. And um, that, those are some of the arguments. I'm certainly not an advocate of it, um, but, but um, one way to think about that is that then, then you have um, um, 
some, some different ways of looking at that that is not as controlled by the legislature that might be, I mean, you could see some potential advantages uh, of it. I mean, there's, there's that uh, uh, perspective as well. But that doesn't get away from the larger point of we need to have more resources and we want to maintain UW system control. So time-wise, I'm going to ask if we can, oh, Gene, one more question. Ms. Salzer, please. Okay, this will be it. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Jean Salzer, Career Development Center. Um, I am an alum. Woohoo. Um, and uh, thank you. And the, the concern that I want to express is related to um, the near future. We are doing everything we can to diminish the cuts and not have to have the hard conversation about what's going to happen with faculty and staff regarding layoffs, regarding cuts to departments and that kind of thing. But I think it's on everyone's mind. And I would appreciate if there could be some sort of talking point regarding if the cut is this much, what do we have to look at? If the cut is this much, because there has to be planning, right? We're talking about July 1st, yeah. four and a half months away, we're going to have a cut. Yeah. We don't know what. So right. there must be some kind of planning that could at least yeah. um, alleviate or allow for people to have some future thought. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think that's a fair question. And um, as uh, one of the charges, one of the suggestions, I will um, basically ask our, our budget uh, planning committee to, as soon as possible, start to provide some general parameters in terms of what we would be looking at. I know at least initially right now we are looking at areas in which you know, how would we absorb $20 million cut given, given our current budget status? So to share some of the thinking on that, I think that's fair. And in our next budget updates, I don't know if it would be as ready as soon as next week, but in the next week or two, we'll, we'll begin to have at least some initial ideas. Is that fair, Robin and Johannes? Okay. So we're okay with that. Well, thank you all once again, and I look forward to seeing you soon. We'll get the date and, and the timing out. We won't have it every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, um, but we'll vary those so that people who teach or do other things um, will we'll, uh, rotate that around. Thank you.